So um, in November last year, my wife and I returned with our family back to Australia after living in the United States for 13 years. And when we got back, we had to go into mandatory uh, quarantine in Sydney, you know, because of coronavirus. And we knew this in advance. We knew when we were, um, you know, preparing to come back that we would have to do this two weeks of quarantine. And I wanted to make the most of my two weeks in quarantine. So before we left, I brought myself a brand new pack of cards because I wanted to use my two weeks of quarantine as wisely as possible. <laughs> See, I wanted to learn close-up magic. I wanted to impress my girls. That's all I really wanted to do. I've got three daughters, and I wanted to impress them by being able to like hold a card up like this, for example, and just move my hands around it and switch it instantly. Oh, I moved too far, and you could all see what I... <laughs> see, the thing is, I never got really good at the close-up magic thing, <laughs> unfortunately. The last time I did that trick for my 17-year-old uh, daughter, I actually dropped all the cards in her bedroom, and she thought that was the trick. She thought that was the funniest thing ever. So I didn't get very far with learning how to do close-up magic, but that whole process of sitting down for two weeks and watching YouTube video after YouTube video on how to do close-up magic, it got me thinking. And it got me thinking around this idea is, wouldn't life be amazing? If there was a magic word that we could say that just made us happy people, wouldn't it be amazing if you could, like, in an instant, with one magic word, go from being, I don't know, from, from like, being worried to being happy? Now, there was this little song that was written in the 1980s by a guy named Bobby McFerrin. And in that song, he said, quite simply, don't worry be happy. And wouldn't that be amazing if you could go literally from don't worry side of the equation to the happy side of the equation just like that, just as simply as saying it? But we all know <laughs> that's not how life works, right? The reason it would be awesome if we could just do that is because there is so much in this world for us to worry about. And the truth is, the reality is, we all worry. We all worry. In fact, if this is your first time to church today or if it's your first time in a long time, you might have come here today worried because you're thinking you don't have anything in common with the people who are sitting around you. But let me tell you this truth today. Everybody in this room worries. And so you have more in common with the people you're sitting next to than you may have realized because you are surrounded today by some world-class warriors. Don't let all the good-looking faces fool you. People in this room are just as worried as you are. In fact, just recently, some researchers did a worldwide study, and they showed that there are certain things that we are all worried about. There are certain things that everyone in the world is worried about. And they listed a couple of them. I want to share a couple of, of them with you today. The first one is, apparently, we're all worried about COVID-19. In fact... Around the world, 50% of people said that's something that they're worried about. Another thing we're worried about is work. And by work, that means, you know, whether or not we have employment, whether or not we're going to have the money to pay the bills, whether or not we're going to have a retirement plan in place. 37% of people right around the whole world are worried about that. And we're also worried about our health. We're worried about getting old. We're worried about dying. And I want to add to that list. I want to add to that list a few things that I personally worry about. One of those things, if I'm really candid and authentic with you today, is that I'm worried about what people think. I'm worried about what you all think of me right now. I'm worried about if you, whether or not you like my outfit. I'm worried about whether or not my hair is okay. I'm wondering if any of you are silently judging me because some words I might say have an American tinge to them. I worry about what people think. I also worry about making mistakes. In fact, one of the biggest mistakes I make in my life is I go through life with the fear that I'm going to make a mistake. And I worry about that. I worry about missing out. 
I worry about what other people are doing and am I missing out on something that I should be doing or that I want to be doing. You might have heard this, it's called FOMO, fear of missing out. And I worry about missing out on things. I also worry about airports. And let's focus on airports for just a minute. See, it's not the travel that worries me. It's not the fear of flying. It's not flying that worries me. It's everything that goes with the travel. See, I get worried on the day of my flight. I get worried about missing my flight. I get worried that my Uber driver is going to show up late. I get worried that there's going to be traffic on the way to the airport that makes me miss my flight. When I'm in the car and I'm on my way to the airport and the traffic is fine, I start to get worried that I didn't pack everything. I get worried that I forgot my passport. I get worried that I forgot my wallet. And then when I get to the airport, I get worried about checking in because I'm worried that my bag is going to be too heavy and they're going to make me pay extra. And then when I get through that process, I get worried about security because I don't want to have to unpack all of my bag on the conveyor belt before it goes through. And then when I get through security, I'm still worried because I'm worried that I misread my boarding pass and I'm at the airport either way too early or way too late, or I'm worried about where the gate is. So I literally am that person who goes to the gate way before I'm about to get on the flight. I'm serious, this is something that I honestly worry about. You ask my family. They will tell you, I have issues. <laughs> but my point is that we all worry. All of us, everybody in this room worries. And wouldn't it be amazing if we could just say a magic word, if we could just say abracadabra, and all of our worries would be gone. Wouldn't that be incredible? Now, here's something interesting. This word, abracadabra, according to tradition, comes from a Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is ibracadabri, which literally means, I will create as I speak. And isn't that what worry really is? We create as we speak and as we think. If I say, geez, I hope I don't get COVID, I get worried about getting COVID. If I say, I hope I don't get let go from my job today, I start to worry about that. If I say, um, I hope I've got enough money in the bank for next week's bills, I start to worry about whether or not I do. I'm creating as I am speaking. If I start to say, I hope I get to the airport on time, guess what I start to worry about? Whether or not I'm going to get to the airport on time, right? Because we create worlds, a world in which the worst possible outcome could happen. And that's really what worry is. And that's why today, in the couple of minutes that I have left, by the end of this message, I want to show you how to worry better. How to worry better. Now, here's the thing. I know that right now there are some people who are worried because you've read the Bible and you know that somewhere, somehow, Jesus said something about not worrying, and so now you're worried that I'm gonna skip over the bit about worrying, but don't worry, because <laughs> I'm gonna address that right now, okay? So, one of Jesus' closest friends, a guy named Matthew, once recorded that Jesus said, do not worry. And then Matthew goes on to explain the context within which Jesus said this, right? And he said that Jesus specifically said there are a couple of things that we shouldn't worry about. First of all, he said, don't worry about having enough food. Then he said, don't worry about having enough to drink. Then he said, don't worry about having clothes to wear. These are some of the things that Jesus said we shouldn't worry about. Do you notice that airports and Uber drivers weren't in that list? Yeah. So I'm okay. <laughs> now, obviously, though, this does not mean that we have freedom to therefore go and worry about everything that does not fall into one of these categories, okay? That was not Jesus' point. And like Pastor Jonathan talked about last week, in fact, I think Jesus' point was that sometimes we worry about the wrong things. We worry about the wrong things. And if you missed last week's message, I want to encourage you right now to, to go back and watch it or listen to it on podcast. If you're watching online, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to, if you're watching on YouTube right now, we're going to put a card, a YouTube card right up here with a link to last week's message, or we're going to put it below me in the YouTube description. So make sure you check that out after you finish watching this message, because it was such a great message. And the point of it was that we worry about the wrong things. 
And I think deep down, we all know this. I think deep down, we all know, but it's so hard to stop. It's so hard to stop worrying. And it doesn't help when people just say, hey, you should just stop worrying, or you should just worry less, or you should don't worry and just be happy. That doesn't help. And this is why I think Jesus, in my opinion, is so much better than the don't worry, be happy guy. He's so much better than Bobby McFerrin. In fact, he is not just a little bit, he's way better than Bobby McFerrin. And you see, the reason is because the Bible doesn't say don't worry, be happy. The Bible doesn't use a magic word to stop us from worrying. Instead, it gives us an example of how to worry. It gives us an example of how we should worry. And, and the example is not a person. The example is a tree. And it's not just any tree, it's an acacia tree. Acacia trees like this one are all over the Holy Land. And I've always taken photos of acacia trees whenever I'm there because this tree reminds me so much of what one of the authors of the Bible, a guy named Jeremiah, had to say about how we should worry better. Now, Jeremiah was a leader in the nation of Israel who lived through Jerusalem. He lived in the town of Jerusalem about 600 years before Jesus. And he lived during a time in his life when Jeremiah had a lot to worry about. He lived through a season when uh, Jerusalem, the, the, his hometown, was invaded and destroyed. And here's the interesting thing. Despite the fact that he lived, he, he lived long enough to see his hometown get burned to the ground and all of his fellow citizens get taken into slavery or killed, Jeremiah is a remarkably hopeful guy. And the four books that he wrote that ended up in our Bible are actually kind of remarkably hopeful books. They've got a very hopeful message about how we can get through hard times, something which Jeremiah obviously knew a lot about. And here's one of the things that Jeremiah wrote. He said this, blessed are those who trust in the Lord. Now, we've already heard in this series that the word blessed actually means happy. So Jeremiah says, happy are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. So Jeremiah is saying here, if we want to have a happy life, then we need to find hope and confidence in the promises of God. But this is the great thing. This is what I love about the Bible. This is why I would encourage all of you to read the Bible a little bit more because there's so much in there that I think sometimes we miss because we cast it away as a book that isn't relevant for today. But it's so relevant for today, especially if you're here and you're worried about something in your life. This is what Jeremiah goes on to explain say he goes on to explain why people who find their hope in God are happy he says this he says they are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water now I can tell you every single rabbi that I have ever spoken to has told me that the tree that Jeremiah is referring to is an acacia tree he goes on to say, such trees, such acacia trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Now there's our word, right? Worry, worried. They're not worried. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Now there is so much for us to unpack in just these couple of verses, but I want to give away the ending. The secret to not worrying or the secret to worrying better is found in the verses that we just read. And they're found in this tree. Let me explain. As I said, I have taken many, many photos of acacia trees in the Holy Land because of the passage we just read. And it's this acacia tree specifically on the right. This is the one that I specifically want us to focus on for a little bit. You see, every time I go to the Holy Land, I, I try to take a photo of this particular tree. And I do that for two reasons. The first reason is this specific tree reminds me most 
of what Jeremiah is talking about in the verses we just read. See, when describing that somebody who is happy, somebody who is blessed, when describing what that person is and and how they're like an acacia tree, Jeremiah starts by saying they are like a tree that is planted by the riverbank. Now, it might not be obvious right now, but let me just point out that that flat bit of ground in between the two hills that this tree is planted on is actually a dried riverbed. You see, this tree is located right in the middle of the Judean wilderness, right in between the Dead Sea and the city of Jericho. This is a part of the desert that has not seen measurable rain in more than a decade. It has not seen rain in more than a decade, which is why this riverbed is so dry. But despite this harsh, dry, brutal conditions, this tree continues to survive because its roots go deep into the ground where it draws up water, which is why Jeremiah writes that this tree is not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Jeremiah then writes that the acacia tree is not only able to survive the harsh desert environment, but it actually thrives because their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Now, the last time I saw this tree, the people I was with actually encouraged me not just to get off the bus and take a photo of it, but they said, hey, you should go off the road, go down the hill and go up to this tree. Now, this tree was, maybe it was half a mile away, or or hang on, half a kilometer away from the road, and they said, we all should go down and check out this tree if you take so many photos of it, and so I did. And so we all went down into the desert towards this tree, and as I got closer, the 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 closer I got, the more that I could see that this tree was doing everything that Jeremiah had spoken about. You see, it was planted by a riverbank, It had deep roots that allowed it to survive the drought. Its leaves were green, which provided shade from the hot desert sun for anybody who was walking past. There was actually a small campfire right next to the tree because local shepherds would come and break a branch off and use it for firewood so that they could cook at night. And as I went up underneath the branches, I noticed that the tree was producing fruit. It had these little berries underneath the branches that the local, uh, like the, the wild goats would come along and they would eat. Not only was this tree surviving the harsh environment, it was also providing for people and animals that came near it. And according to Jeremiah, if you want to worry better when life gets harsh, when life gets barren, when life gets dry, then you need to be like this acacia tree. See, the acacia tree survives the harshest, driest, most difficult conditions because it has a deep root system. And the same, in exactly the same way, we will be able to survive and thrive when hard, dry conditions come upon us, when life gets hard, if we have deep roots in faith. If we have deep roots in our faith, we will be able to survive the harsh times just like this acacia tree. Now, I don't know where you stand on the whole idea of faith. I don't know what that word means to you. Maybe you had faith when you were younger, but you've stepped away because of a bad church experience. Or maybe you stepped away because the faith you had as a child couldn't live up to the questions you had as an adult. Maybe you stepped away from faith because you don't consider yourself to be a religious person, well, I've got some good news for you. Stick around here long enough, you'll see that we're not religious people either. I don't know what faith looks like to you, but faith is not about reading more of the Bible or going to more church services. Those are expressions of faith. And faith is not just simply believing whatever a pastor or a church tells you you should believe. According to Jeremiah... Faith is trusting and finding hope in the promise that God is with you and that God is for you. According to Jeremiah, having faith is trusting and finding hope in the promise that God is with you 
and God is for you. And this is not just the Christian definition of faith. If you go to any dictionary, the definition that they will give of faith is to have a deep trust or confidence in someone or something. It's just what Jeremiah wrote about. According to Jeremiah, faith is having deep trust and confidence in the promises that God has for you, that he is with you and that he is for you. And this is a promise that honestly, I believe. I've believed it since I was in year 11 in high school. I've believed that promise that Jesus made, that he would be with me and that he would be for me. And I have found confidence and hope because of that promise. And practically speaking, I found that following Jesus will make your life better and make you better at life. Having faith in Jesus, being somebody who follows Jesus' example has made me a better husband. It's made me a better dad. It's made me a better neighbor, a better friend, a better employee. It's made me a better man. It's made me a better human being, quite frankly. And it's made me able to deal with worry better too. Now, this is really important. I want everybody to, to, to listen to this. No matter where you stand on the whole faith spectrum, I, this part is really important. I really want you to listen to this. Having a deep faith won't mean that you will avoid hard times. It just means that you will, hope, you will have hope in the middle of hard times. Having faith doesn't mean... Having faith means you will still have hard times, but hard times won't have you. You will still have hard times, but hard times won't have you. See, I found in my life that following Jesus doesn't change what you deal with, but it does change how you deal with it. Following Jesus doesn't change what you deal with. It just changes your approach your purpose, your sense of hope, your sense of confidence when you're going through those things, those hard times. It means you can go through life worrying about the right things because you know that God is with you when things go wrong. So the first reason I always take photos of this particular acacia tree is because it reminds me of what Jeremiah said. And I think it best symbolizes everything that Jeremiah wrote about, about having faith and about being happy and about worrying better. The second reason I always take a photo of this specific tree is because it reminds me of a very close friend and mentor. See, whenever I stand in front of this tree in the Holy Land, I'm always reminded of my friend, John Woodall. John is a man I met when I was on staff at a church called North Point in Atlanta, Georgia. And whenever I go to this tree, I always uh, take a photo on my camera for Instagram, and then I take a photo on my phone for John. And while I'm still standing in front of that tree, I text him the photo, and I text him some encouragement. And my text is always the same. I send him the photo and then I just send him a text that says, you remind me of this acacia tree. You see, John, um, the first time I ever met John, who was a pastor on staff at North Point as well, I met him about two months after he lost his granddaughter, who was just 14 days old when she died. Then two years later, John lost another grandchild when his grandson crawled out into the backyard, fell into the pool, and drowned just days before his first birthday. And through all of these tragic, heartbreaking events, John's deep faith allowed him to lead his family through the harshest, the most painful, the most devastating season of their lives. John's faith reminded him that when all seemed lost, God was still with him. And that is what gave him confidence. That's what gave him hope. I've seen John cry many times over his family. I've heard him acknowledge how hard and difficult these times were and, and still are. But through it all, John's faith has kept him focused on hope. 
John is like this acacia tree because in the middle of the harshest, most difficult circumstances imaginable, he has stood strong because his roots were buried deep into his faith and into his confidence in God. He has been able to stand strong for his family and he's been able to comfort them. And he's also continued to bless the people around him, people like me. The hope that John found in hard times has helped so many others find hope when they're going through hard times as well. John Woodall, to me, is a living example of what I said earlier, that following Jesus doesn't change what you deal with, but it does change how you deal with it. It doesn't change what you deal with, but it does change how you deal with it. And John, one of the most hopeful, one of the most um, confident and faithful men I've ever met, actually texted me just a few days ago while I was preparing this message. And he was asking if I could send him a photo of our acacia tree. He said he wanted to be reminded of the tree because he was facing another difficult season that was causing him some worry. And so I sent him both of these photos. These are the exact photos I sent him. See, when it comes to worrying, we all need reminders of how to worry better. It's not something we just get and then we're good at it for the rest of our lives. We all need constant reminders of how to worry better, how to have faith in God's promises. Regardless of how deep our faith is, we all need a reminder that there is hope in the middle of a difficult season. We all need reminders that we can get through hard times. And so today, I want to give you the same thing that I gave my friend John just a few days ago. Maybe today you're facing a tough season and you just need a reminder that there is hope, that you can have confidence that God is with you. You need a reminder that God is for you right now. Maybe today you're worried about your job. Maybe today you're worried about how you're going to pay next month's bills. Maybe today you're worried about the health of a loved one or you're worried about the health of a relationship with a loved one. If so, I want you to have a photo of an acacia tree to remind you to find hope, to remind you to find confidence in the promise that God will get you through this season. It's not a magic word that will instantly take away all of your worries. It's not that. But I hope that this photo will be a reminder that you are an acacia tree, that you have everything in you already to survive the toughest, driest, hardest seasons that you might face. So to make it really easy for you to download these photos, all you need to do is scan this QR code. I'm going to keep this slide up for the rest of the talk so you don't have to rush. And it's going to stay up while you leave, so it's going to be there. But when you scan this QR code, it's going to take you to a website where you can download the photo. And I deliberately made the photo 9 by 16, which is the size of your phone, so that you can have it as a wallpaper on your phone. And if you don't have a phone that's able to scan a QR code, that, we got you covered as well. There's actually some printed out versions up the back, which you can take and stick to your mirror in your bathroom, have it in your car as a constant reminder. Again, it's not a magic word that will take away all of your worries. But my hope is that the next time you're worried or facing a situation that is difficult and hard, that you will look at this image and be reminded to be like an acacia tree. My hope is that you'll be reminded that during whatever tough situation you face, that you can have confidence and find hope in knowing that God is with you and that God is for you. My hope is that this photo of an acacia tree will remind you to trust that God is for you, no matter what's happening around you. That you will have confidence that God is for you, no matter what's happening to you. Imagine what life would be like if any time we faced a tough, dry, hard, barren season, that we could find hope instead of worry. 
that instead of being filled with stress and anxiety and worry, you became filled with hope. Can you imagine what life would be like if that was the case for you? Because that's what happy people do. And that's what happy people know. They know how to have that confidence when life dries up. Let's pray. God, we thank you that we have this crazy reminder of what it means to have faith, of what it means to have hope. And God, um, I just thank you so much for protecting these ancient words written thousands of years ago so that today we can still learn from the wisdom that is found within them. God, thank you for that. I pray that today, uh, everybody here, everybody who's watching online, everybody who's under the sound of my voice would know a new definition of faith, would know a new definition of hope, would find a new definition of what it means to be confident in the promises of God that you are with us and for us. God, I pray that the, the truth that we as Christians believe that you, you are with us and for us would drive deep roots for us so that we would stand strong when life gets hard. And we pray all of these things in the amazing, the healing, the holy, the powerful name of Jesus. And everybody agreed and said, amen, amen. 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 Guys, thank you so much for coming. We hope you'll come back next week as we close out the series with a very special interview with Dr. Chris Muller. I'm sure you're going to love it. Cheers, guys. Have a great day.